those of you who know Skip Rutherford know that uh, he's in this habit of saying really nasty things about people, so <laughs> you have to take what he said in context. Uh, I'm very grateful, Skip. My one complaint is that I've known Skip for almost 20 years. He looks exactly the same as he did in the early 1990s in Washington. I think that's the difference between living down here and living in Washington. It's living the right kind of life. And I want to also echo what Skip said about the Compurises. Thank you so much for what you're doing here. I wish I got to know your father, and I would love sometime to meet your mother, but I'm so glad that you're able to be here tonight. I think there's not a bad idea to have one more hand for them. And Skip was right. I was here three years ago, and I saw Terry just when she was starting out as the director of the Clinton Library. And it's a real pleasure to see how it's blossoming and a huge success, which I knew then, but now we've got evidence in retrospect, which we historians like to have. And I guess I particularly have that in mind because not every presidential library gets off to such a great start. Uh, how many here have been to the Johnson Library in Texas? Well, quite a lot. Austin. Well, the Johnson Library, you probably know, opened in 1971. And if you had to think of a moment in history that would be a worse moment to open a museum to the glories of Lyndon Johnson, probably 1971 would be about as bad as it gets. War in Vietnam was going on. And the Johnson Library, in great contrast to the Clinton Library at the beginning, just was not getting visitors. And LBJ knew this because, very much in character, he would call the director of the library every morning and say, how many people came to my library yesterday? <laughs> An experience that Terry has not had. And the problem was that the director had to give him bad news, you know, not too many, Mr. President, and he wondered if he was going to have his job for very much longer. What the director did not tell President Johnson was, with, I'd say, marginal taste, among the members of the library staff, they began referring to this daily figure as the body count. <laughs> and after a while, they began inflating the body count to please President Johnson, which had happened before when he was back in Washington. None of that worked. So finally, he got an idea. Those of you who have been to the Johnson Library may have noticed it's uh, across the street from a rather large football stadium which gets probably how many, t how many people to a game in the fall? 60,000? University of Texas, 60,000 plus. A uh, lot of people. So LBJ, and this is you know, one way of seeing the way the guy worked, he got an idea which was that he called up the guy who made announcements at halftime in these football games and said, make an announcement at halftime on Saturday that anybody who wants to take a leak or get a, some cool water can do it at the Johnson Library across the street. <laughs> And the announcement was made, and by the end of 1971, the Johnson Library was the best attended presidential library <laughs> in the United States. And I think even at this late date, Terry, is it number three or four? Number three for a library that's been open for uh, 40 years. The uh, point I'm making is that you may think that libraries open and are always as successful as the Clinton Library, but this is all extremely unusual and we should be very grateful to those who helped to bring it about. Uh, I was trying to think about the first time I actually met President Clinton when I was thinking about coming up here. And what actually occurred to me, I was talking to my son who's 16 years old and who's about 6'2", six 6'3", six he's taller than I am and can break me easily in half. He plays varsity football on his high school team. I was telling him about the fact that the first time I ever had dinner in the White House was in October of 1993. It was a dinner that the President and Mrs. Clinton had in the Blue Room, round tables, I would say about 40 or 50 people. And that day was important to my wife and myself because earlier that day we found that my wife was pregnant for the first time. And you know, it was early in the pregnancy, so we thought, you know, we're not going to tell anyone because you know, better to be cautious. And so we got to the Blue Room, and she had the honor of sitting at President Clinton's right and was mesmerized all evening. And so I came over to say hello at the end of the dinner. And I said, did you tell the president our news? And she said, well, I thought we were not supposed to tell anyone. I said, I think you can trust him not to tell anyone else. <laughs> so she did tell him about our baby coming along the way. Uh, seemed like a long time ago now, 16 years ago.
and he has grown up, and President Clinton did not divulge our secrets, so uh, it was a very good test of character, which uh, I knew he would pass with flying colors. But, you know, that's the way that history works, because, you know, I think for Skip, probably 1993 probably seems not only as if it were yesterday, but probably last hour. It seems to pass so quickly. And that's the way that we historians look, uh, look at things, and Skip is very much of an historian, so he looks at, the, at things this way, too. Historians look at presidents a little bit differently from the way that journalists and citizens do. We sometimes uh, lose track of that because we sort of think that these days we know almost everything there is to know about a president in real time, you know, between the internet and they're so well covered. But the thing, you know, I, I'm going to make an argument for waiting at least for a historian writing a book about a last president. If you wait at least a couple of decades, our books can bring you two things that contemporary people cannot have. And one of them is access to information, and the other is hindsight. I was talking to Bruce Lindsay a little bit earlier about the fact that these days people around a president are actually told to keep as few records as possible because unlike the days of Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt, you know, pieces of paper leak. There are some, uh, every president since Gerald Ford, including Ford, has had to deal with special prosecutors who subpoenaed presidential records. And it's absolutely natural that the people around a president you know, minimize the paper trail. It's very smart for a president. If I were president, it's the first thing I would do, but terrible for us historians because the result is the sources that we need to write history, getting access to a president's diary decades later or to letters, these are drying up and we're going to have a much harder time writing about presidents in retrospect and showing you things that perhaps you didn't know at the time. Uh, one example of this. In 1961, John Kennedy was meeting with the British Prime Minister whose name was Harold Macmillan in London. And I was writing a book on this some years ago when I was researching it. And you read the New York Times article about this, and the Times says, you know, the president and the prime minister talked about the Soviet Union and the balance of payments, a couple of other things. And they did, but when I was writing this book, I had just got open some notes that were taken by someone who was actually there in this private meeting. And it turns out that, uh, yes, they did discuss those things, but Kennedy spent an awful lot of the time talking to Harold, complaining about bad press coverage of Jackie, uh, reporters were saying that she traveled too much and spent too much money. Kennedy actually didn't disagree with that, but he didn't like seeing it in the press. So he's going on at great length. And so finally, Harold Macmillan, who's a generation older, said, Jack, just brush it off. It's just the press. You know, why are you getting so upset? And that just irritated Kennedy further. He said, well, that's easy for you to say, Harold. How would you like it if your wife, Lady Dorothy, were depicted in the newspapers as a drunk? And actually, she was a drunk. Uh, and Macmillan had a sense of proportion. He just replied, if that happened, I would just issue a statement saying you should have seen her mother. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difference between you know, studying a president in real time and studying him later on. That's the kind of access to records that we have. Uh, maybe one other example. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I don't have the honor of coming from Arkansas. I come from Illinois, which uh, has been known for leadership uh, of some questionable conduct in recent <laughs> years, but uh, talking about states and how many presidents come from there, uh, Illinois has not done badly. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and Barack Obama and uh, Ronald Reagan and Ulysses Grant. I, I won't go on, but <laughs> we do well in Illinois. And in any case, uh, when I was growing up in Illinois, we used to hear a lot about Adlai Stevenson, who was never president but ran for president twice. And he was considered a big deal in Illinois. And so, like an idiot, the first time I met one of Stevenson's aides, I think I was about 19, just starting as an historian, I said, you know, you must have learned so much about campaigning going around with a great man, Stevenson. And the aide said, well, actually, Stevenson was a terrible campaigner. And my face fell. And he went on to say, this is the kind of thing that happened. He said, we were campaigning in northern Florida, uh, Florida primary 1956 against Estes Kefauver. And even Stevenson knew he was not co connecting with these voters. So Stevenson says to the staff, what am I doing wrong? An awkward silence ensued. <laughs> 
uh, I think the aides were saying, you know, well, we want to be ambassador to Bermuda, and if we tell him the truth, we're not going to get the embassy. <laughs> but I think finally one of them figured that Stevenson was going to lose to Eisenhower that year anyway, so why not tell him the truth? So one of the aides stepped forward and bravely said, Governor, here's the problem. Remember this morning, northern Florida, we were in that shopping center, and uh, that little girl came up to you and handed you that stuffed dead baby alligator? Stevenson said yes. The aide said what you should have told her was, thank you, little girl, that'll look perfect in my living room back in Illinois, instead of what you did tell her governor, which was, for Christ's sake, what's this? <laughs> it's the kind of thing that, if a little time passes, uh, you begin to understand these people a little bit more in three dimensions. Uh, there's one other story I'm struggling. I think it's a really questionable taste, but it's about President Johnson, and many of them are. So is this OK, Terry? Uh, I'm getting absolution before I tell it. Uh, I wrote a couple of books on these tapes that LBJ made of his private conversations. And a lot of interesting ones, but in the Johnson community, I think many of their favorite, I won't say ours, uh, I'll say theirs, is a conversation that LBJ had on the telephone in August of 1964. He was at the LBJ ranch, and he called up the head of the Hagar Slacks Company, whose name was Joe Hagar, and he says, you know, I have some Hagar Slacks, and I like them, I want to get some more, but they're not quite comfortable. And he goes into extreme detail anatomically to describe why they're not comfortable, <laughs> which I won't inflict on you. I guess the one thing I can say is Johnson says they're like riding a wire fence. Well. Mr. Hagar got the idea. He had some tailor-made trousers sent to Johnson. Everyone was happy. So I put it in the book. He did say it. And this is an example of the kind of thing that you can get later on, you know, things that are great and small. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson was kind enough to give a dinner for my wife and myself just after that book came out. And I said, Mrs. Johnson, were you happy with the way the book was received? And she said, well, you know, she always told the truth. She said, Michael, I probably could have lived out the rest of my life happily without hearing you on Larry King Live play the Hagar Slacks conversation. <laughs> she said, but she said, you should know, that conversation is my grandchildren's favorite. <laughs> so anyone who could explain that to me, I'd love to hear an explanation at the end of the evening. And the other thing is about a month after that, I got a letter from old Mr. Hagar offering me a free pair of custom-made Hagar Slacks. So, <laughs> who says there are no perks for historians. But that's the kind of thing that you really can get if you wait a while for an historian to write a book about a president, you know, the kind of thing that you couldn't get in real time. And sometimes the small details tell you a lot about a president, as my story, I think, about LBJ and the Johnson Library shows you a little bit of a side of him. But the more important thing than all of that, I think, is hindsight. And that is that Historians, I think all of us have to agree that you can't really understand what was important about a president until you wait about 30 or 40 years. Because you know, if you wait that long, things that seemed obsessively important at the time a president served, 30, 40 years later, you're almost uninterested in. And oftentimes things that were not very important, seemingly at the time a president serves, Later on, you wait and you find that they were very important, had a big effect on history. The best example I can give you is the one I always like, is Harry Truman, who in 1953 went back to Missouri with a low Gallup poll rating. Anyone remember or want to take a guess? This will not hurt your GPA at the Clinton School if any of the Clinton School students would like to hazard a guess. 30? 25%? Do I hear lower? Uh, it was about 22, 23%. And in 1953, 23% was like about 10% nowadays, because if you can believe it, in 1953, people were shy about telling a pollster they didn't like a president. Uh, it's not a problem that we had in 2010, but they did then. <laughs> And so Truman was not well thought of. And when I began to study him, I thought, you know, what was going on here? And I looked at the data, and, you know, yes, there was some petty corruption in his entourage. The war in Korea was very unpopular. An amazing number of people said, I don't like Truman because he doesn't sound like Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, the true story is actually told that uh, Truman was asked in 1952 by a reporter, 
what do you think of Richard Nixon? And his reply was, I think that Nixon is full of manure. And the aides went to Mrs. Truman and said, couldn't you get the boss to speak a little bit more elegantly? And she said, you have no idea how long it took for me to get him to use the word manure. That's what <laughs> she was doing. Right? But that seemed really important in 1953. It doesn't in 2010. I would say, if you had to think of all the things that Harry Truman did that probably are most important to me in looking back at his leadership, I'd say that he had a lot to do with winning the Cold War. In 1953, Americans knew that he had done NATO and he had wound up World War II and uh, done a number of other things, such as the Marshall Plan, that helped to embolden the West. But in 1953, we could not know how the Cold War would end. Here we are now with that much hindsight. Looking back at it 2020, we know that the Cold War ended in American victory and we know that Harry Truman deserves a lot of the credit. So in retrospect, he is a much greater man, I think, to historians and Americans than he sure seemed in 1953 when he was getting 22, 23 percent in the Gallup poll. And that's the way that history is, is supposed to work. But I think there's a little bit of a misapprehension by some people that, you know, you sort of figure that a president gets out of office, is considered either a great president or a bad president, and that sort of sticks for the rest of history. It's happened in a couple of occasions. George Washington's stock with Americans has been pretty high, as it should be, from the moment he left the presidency. Same thing with Abraham Lincoln, for the most part. Uh, looking at the other end, Warren Harding was popular at the time he died, but a, a year later was the Teapot Dome scandal, and Ever since then, there's not been much fluctuation in the view that Harding was probably at the bottom of the presidential ladder. But those are unusual cases, because usually a president almost fluctuates almost like on a stock exchange through history. And what happens is that oftentimes there's a historical era that's congenial to the legacy of the president, and people are more eager to look back on that president and see the good things about him, and other periods less so. Best example I can think of is Theodore Roosevelt, who won re-election by a large margin in uh, 1904, was still popular enough that he could consider running for president again in 1912, and was a beloved figure. But you hit the 1920s, and TR was scorned, because the 1920s was a period where most Americans, as they showed by electing Harding and Coolidge, felt that the government should not be involved much in the economy, that America should not be involved much in the world, and that was almost the opposite of what Theodore Roosevelt was known for. You get to the 1930s and the 1940s, Franklin Roosevelt, who's doing all sorts of things to fight the Depression, then fight World War II, that's a period during which TR is much more in sync. TR's historical reputation went up. That's oftentimes the way it happens. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is another example. He was praised in his time, certainly while World War I was being fought. Then he was out of office in 1921, that same period of Harding, when people were against the idea of the United Nations or a country that was very much involved in the world, and Wilson's legacy dropped. Then you get to the 1940s. What was Franklin Roosevelt trying to do at the end of World War II? He was trying to build a United Nations, very much modeled on Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations, and he felt that unlike Wilson, he was not going to make the same mistakes and hoped that a United Nations would make sure that there was not another world war. And that's the way it happened. And so people began to look back and say, perhaps there was more about Woodrow Wilson that was good than perhaps I was thinking about. Now, what can a president do when he's serving uh, to have himself be well remembered by history? Well, obviously, the, the best way is to do a terrific job. But there are other ways as well. One is to get reelected. If you look through history, uh, most of the presidents who are taken seriously and admired are presidents who were able to get reelected. And oftentimes, presidents who weren't are scorned by historians, uh, historians and scholars. And I think later Americans feel that reelection is a test not only of that president's performance in the first term, but also about his political skills, which were certainly would have been an important uh, factor of his leadership. Uh, another thing that a president can do uh, to make sure he's well remembered by history is to make sure that he 
keeps as many private papers as possible. This is a little bit against you know, the trend of the last few decades. But oftentimes, pri uh, private papers, presidents' memos and letters and diaries, other things, when they're open, they will show historians a side of a president that we hadn't seen before. Great example would be Dwight Eisenhower, who in the 1950s, even by many people who admired Eisenhower, felt that this was a great man, but his greatness was during the time of World War II, not really at the time of his presidency, and that his presidency was sort of anti-climax, and Eisenhower wasn't even aware of very much of what was going on in his own administration. The bad joke, you know, the Eisenhower doll, you wind it up and it does nothing for eight years. You know, that was largely the view of Eisenhower, not only by his critics in the early 1960s. Then in the 1970s, Eisenhower's diaries began to come open. His letters, this was someone who wrote 16, 17 page letters that really gave you an idea of what was going on in his mind. There were records of national security meetings showing what the president had said and what others had said back. And the people who thought that Eisenhower was sort of a boob began looking at all this and realizing that this was a very smart man, a very active mind, very much pulling the, own, the, the strings of his own administration, but this was someone who didn't want the credit for it in public. One reason was that Eisenhower was a fairly modest person. And the other reason was he was a very shrewd man. He realized that he would probably be more effective in that time and being Eisenhower, the great national hero, if he did not call attention to a lot of the things that he was doing that he felt were good for the country, but probably pretty controversial. So when scholars began looking at these papers, they were knocked over in many cases. You know, we didn't realize this guy was so smart. We re didn't realize that he wrote so well. We didn't realize that he was the, the most active and energetic and most intelligent person in almost any room when national security was being discussed. And most of all, when a president's paper is open, you begin to see life from the president's point of view. Lyndon Johnson used to always say that his father told him, you will never know what it is like being a father until you are a father. Probably not bad advice. Problem with us presidential historians is that for very good reason, we are not going to become president. So the next best thing is to try to get into a former president's head by reading the paper that came to his desk and understanding issues and people from his point of view. It almost always brings a president's reputation up because you, know, you begin to see it from his vantage point and understand that life was a little bit more difficult for him than it may have seemed at the time. Uh, another thing that a president can do that really does help him, uh, I think, is to uh, talk later, to write about his presidency later and talk to historians. Uh, President Clinton has done this. We were talking about Ulysses Grant earlier, uh, with the exception of President Clinton. I think Ulysses Grant wrote the great presidential memoir, or not presidential memoir, but the great memoir by a president in history, which he finished four days before he died. For a president to write a memoir has the same effect. You begin to understand things from the president's point of view. And when you have a president who writes as well as Bill Clinton or Ulysses Grant, all the more so. It has even more of an effect. Another thing I think uh, that has an effect on the way we see a president, remember I was talking about how Wilson was down in the 20s, up in the 1940s? Well, a variation of that is that oftentimes we Americans will go through a period just after the time that a president serves and realize that perhaps it was not so easy for the former president at the time as it may have appeared. And Eisenhower is example A of this. Uh, Eisenhower in the 1950s not only was seen to be passive and quiescent and not very active and some people thought of him as not very bright, but they also felt, you know, what's the big deal? Nothing happened during these eight years. And in certain ways they were right. I think probably Eisenhower didn't do as much as he should have about civil rights and perhaps about poverty. But you look at the 1950s and these were at least seven and a half years after the settlement of the Korean War, seven and a half years of peace and prosperity. And when Eisenhower left office with that record, he was very frustrated and he said, direct quote, he said, you know, it was seven and a half years of peace and prosperity. You know, it didn't just happen, I'll tell you that. Uh, people did not listen to him at the time. 
than what happened in the 1960s. Uh, not terribly much peace, the Vietnam War began, not much prosperity, huge inflation in the late 1960s, great national traumas, unlike the country that was fairly unified under Eisenhower. So by 1970, the feat of Eisenhower in creating eight years of peace and prosperity, people realized that it probably took a little bit more effort than people realized or gave him credit for at the time. So what do you want from presidential historians who write about presidents? I think the best thing is for you to try to understand a president as an historian, almost not even remembering the way that people looked at him at the time, because to an extent that can be blinding. And when a president's reputation begins to move from politics into history, that's when this whole process begins. Uh, probably the first 10 or 20 years is too difficult because the president is still well remembered by people who are alive, certainly by historians. Most presidents are controversial, so you have to wait to get beyond that window to, be, to begin to see a president whole. But what happens after that is this, you know, what I think is an amazing alchemy of private papers opening and begin to see the president as a historical figure, not just as a political figure, and having the distance to see the president really in three dimensions. Now, President Clinton left office in 2001, so uh, 20 years from that is 2021, so we can begin discussing all this as good historians in 2021, but I think in light of the things I've talked about tonight, I think we can begin to see which way things are going. Uh, number one, uh, have Americans had a good time in the last nine years nationally? It's been a very difficult time for many reasons. But I think in, in much the same way as the 1960s made people appreciate the leadership of Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s, I think that there's a very good chance that the traumas that Americans have lived through horribly in many cases during the last nine years will make people appreciate the fact that Bill Clinton was, like Eisenhower, president who brought us eight years of peace and prosperity, and people didn't realize that that didn't just happen. It took really very effective leadership. Uh, the next thing that's going to happen is that President Clinton's private papers are opening with a vengeance. Uh, we have two people in the front row who are largely responsible for that, Terry Gardner and Skip Rutherford. But the person mainly responsible for that is President Clinton. And that is something that many presidents don't do. Uh, many presidents are worried about their records. They resist opening papers and tapes. One president I can particularly think of, Richard Nixon, who spent millions of dollars for the last 20 years of his life fighting in the National Archives in the United States to keep as many of his papers and tapes closed as possible. When you have a president who opens papers and other records as energetically as possible, like President Clinton, like President Bush 41, like Dwight Eisenhower, it sends a message to historians. You know, we're people too, it may not seem that way sometimes, but you know, we have a human reaction. If we walk into a presidential library we, where we know that they are almost you know, fighting to resist opening presidential documents, you know, what does that tell us? It tells us that the president's entourage must be very defensive about the president's legacy and there must be something wrong here. But if you see people who are operating on behalf of a living president, who basically say, we want as much of the record opened as quickly as possible, sends exactly the opposite message. What it says is, you know, we are proud of this president. We think that the more you learn about him, the more you will admire him the way that we do because we got to see him behind the scenes. And I was part of something that was an example of that, and that was these Johnson tapes I mentioned. Do people know about those? I'll talk a little bit about them for those who don't or don't remember. Lyndon Johnson, when he was president, uh, taped uh, 10,000 of his private conversations on the telephone, in you know, the Oval Office, in the cabinet room, in his bedroom, on the LBJ ranch. And the people who were being taped, 99% of them did not know that they were being taped, including Mrs. Johnson. And uh, she took this in good humor, but when I was starting to write two books about these, you know, I asked my wife, is it okay if I write about LBJ, because a lot of historians become like the person that they're writing about. She wasn't sure she wanted to wake up to 
next to LBJ for the next five years. But then I played her a tape of LBJ talking to Lady Bird on the telephone. He talked to her just beautifully. He said, my darling, I long to see you. My wife took one listen to that and said, this is exactly the book that you should be writing. You really should <laughs> talk more the way that he did. So it had a little bit of a good effect. But he taped these 10,000 private conversations. Almost no one knew about it. He took the tapes back to Texas, put them in a vault, told almost no one in his entourage that he had done this. And about 10 days before he died, we were just upstairs in President Clinton's you know, really beautiful apartment here in this library. President Johnson had, had a 1969 version of this. Uh, this is contemporary and just in keeping with the elegance of this entire building. If you go into President Johnson's private apartment, which still exists about as it was, it's like going into a museum of 1969 modern decor. And I don't know how many remember that, but it is not too beautiful. Uh, <laughs> enormous white naugahyde sofas and you know triple tiny sony tv sets attached to every surface because he always wanted to be in touch but 10 days before johnson died in 1973 he was sitting on his extremely large barca lounger in this apartment you know relaxing and he called in one of his aides and she was one of the few people who knew about the tapes he said well i I'm not feeling well. I don't know how long I'm going to live. And she said, Mr. President, you've got a long way to go. And he said, no, my doctors have told me I don't have long, and I really should begin thinking about things very seriously. He had already been simplifying his estate and deciding what would happen after he uh, died. And so he said, you know, you're one of the few people who knows about the tapes. This is what I want done. He hadn't even done a deed of gift or any kind of piece of paper saying what should happen to these things. And legally, he still owned these tapes. He said, it's too late for me to do a formal document, so I want you to know what my intention is, and you do an affidavit after I'm gone to tell people what I said. And what Johnson said was, 10,000 conversations, he didn't know, well, he didn't remember what he'd said on probably 99% of them. And he said, these should be locked up for 50 years after my death. And 50 years later, the director of the Johnson Library and members of my family who were living at that time should listen to all these tapes and decide whether they should be opened, whether embarrassing ones should be destroyed, or whether the entire collection should be destroyed. And knowing LBJ, my guess is that he was probably in favor of option three because uh, how many think that LBJ would be overjoyed to have the Hagar Slacks conversation played on Larry King? He thought that that would be humiliating. Instead, what it actually had the effect of was people saw Johnson as a much more interesting and colorful and almost contemporary figure because of conversations like that. But in any case, that's where things stood. And then in the early 1990s, Lady Bird Johnson, with huge courage, said what I was saying before. I love my husband, I admire him, I know that he had faults, but I think that the more we know about him, the more that people are going to admire his leadership too. She said, I suspect that there are going to be things on these tapes that I do not like, and I know that I have to open all of them or none of them, but I'd really rather open all of them and let people begin to understand the 1960s from my husband's point of view. So the tapes began coming open in the mid-1990s, and I would say that most people would say that the net effect on President Johnson's reputation has been to shoot it upwards for the reasons I'm talking about. People no longer saw him as this inscrutable figure who did nothing but escalate in Vietnam. And when they watched him from afar, you know, he gave great speeches on civil rights, but people wondered, oh, were those just speeches or did Johnson really mean it? What did he say in private? Well, you listen to these conversations in private, and if anything, he feels more strongly about civil rights in poverty on these tapes in private than he could say in public because he didn't want to seem too radical. And on Vietnam, I don't think it especially improves his reputation on Vietnam because no one can ever or should ever contradict the record of 50,000 Americans who lost their lives for a cause that to this day is somewhat murky. But remember I was talking about seeing things from a president's point of view? At least you begin to understand the options he had. And there's one tape that really captures this for me. In early 1965, LBJ had just been reelected, and 
in February of 1965, he was beginning to escalate the Vietnam War in a big way. By the end of that year, he was going to send 175,000 Americans to Vietnam. And he's on this tape talking to Robert McNamara, his defense secretary, and he says, Bob, I can't think of anything worse than losing the Vietnam War, but I do not see any way that we can win. And I heard this thing, you know, don't see any way we can win. You know, if this were 1968 or 1969, I could understand it, but this is 1965. And so I thought, well, maybe he's momentarily discouraged. And I listened to more tapes, and it really is a refrain in private. And you see the conflict between this man who's sending these young men and some women off to Vietnam in public and in private at the beginning, having grave doubts about whether this war can be won at all. And by the summer of 1965, he's telling Lady Bird about the Vietnam War. He says, I feel as if I'm in a, on, in a plane that's crashing, and I do not have a parachute. You begin to understand things from his point of view, you know, in ways that are flattering and some ways that are not so flattering. Going back the previous year, he's beginning to think, you know, what do I do about Vietnam? A lot of people are coming and telling him, you have no choice. You know, you became president because President Kennedy died. You know, this is what he intended. You cannot forsake President Ken Kennedy's legacy and pull out of Vietnam. One of the people who uh, were giving him that advice was Robert Kennedy, the president's brother. Very different view from what we saw at the time. So what I'm saying is that the next great example I think that we will all see of alchemy being performed on a president's legacy and, and reputation and period in office will be the time of Bill Clinton. And I've said this privately, I will say it publicly, I think you were doing it all just right. Because I suspect that the more information we get, the more papers that we get, the more hindsight, the more we begin to ponder how difficult it was to be president in the 1990s, I would foresee the president's reputation doing nothing but going up for a very long time. And this is the building in which all this will happen. I will look forward very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, um, for that tremendous lecture. Um, we're I'm sorry, have... it ran a little long. Uh, I remember I was talking about historians resembling the people they write about, and <laughs> I wanted to warn you at the beginning, I've, I've written about Hubert Humphrey, who, <laughs> whose speeches were about three or four hours long. And once Humphrey did this, and, and even he thought it was going too long, he yells, anyone here got a watch? And someone yelled back, how about a, how about a calendar? So I, <laughs> I did not want to resemble him. Okay, do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Back here, and please wait for uh, one of our volunteers to bring you a microphone. Harry Truman's library was the first library that I went to. I read something recently about him being... At, at what age did you go? Actually, it was 19 when I went to the Future Farmers of America convention in Kansas City. Do you mind my asking you, what is the thing you most remember seeing in the library? The thing actually I most remember was the tombs in the complex. What was the? The tombs. Uh -huh. But the question I've got is, I read recently where he was a bag man for the mob. A woman was watching television with her grandson, and she mentioned this is the president. She goes, oh, that's Harry. He was a bag man for the mob. What do you know about his mob ties? Zero, because there weren't any. Uh, <laughs> It may have come from the fact that he began his political career as a protege of a corrupt boss in Kansas City called Boss Pendergast. But uh, people who pay attention to that do not notice that Pendergast was in the habit of getting very honest people into office as sort of, you know, to show that he was not entirely corrupt. Uh, as I mentioned, I come from Chicago, and the old Mayor Daley used to do the same thing. Adlai Stevenson got his start in politics as the protege of the machine in Chicago that finally became the elder Mayor Daley machine. So no truth to that. Problem is that these things, you know, in history develop a life of their own. I'm not a huge admirer of J. Edgar Hoover for all sorts of reasons, but uh, anyone heard that Hoover wore dresses sometimes in private? He never did. The only source for that is a woman who was the widow of 
someone that Hoover sent to prison. And that story made its way into a book. It's a great story. It got around. It's on the internet. So you know, all sorts of people now think that Hoover wore dresses in private. He may have, but there's no evidence that he did. So that's the problem. Thank you. Yes, sir, here. Mr. Bessler, I want to just say thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Dixon McReynolds. I'm a first year Clinton student okay. and a fan of yours. Well, thank you. uh, I've been very impressed with your work over the years as you bring, take us behind the scene with presidents on MSNBC and NBC. And so I'm a big I, fan. I hope I haven't blown it this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that you have to know where you've been before you know where you're going. I uh, got a question. I'm a retired military. And I just wanted to find out your perspective as far as how, do, how does history uh, judge former wartime presidents in general? How, how do historians look at them as, as time goes on? It's a defect of, of, I mean, historians, this is not a perfect process, the process I've been describing. A lot of it has to do with success. Uh, if Lyndon Johnson had succeeded in winning the Vietnam War by the end of 1966, I think the Vietnam War would be seen as a great episode in American history. That's despite the fact that Johnson got a Gulf of Tonkin resolution from Congress under somewhat you know, gray circumstances, to put it as politely as I can, and was not exactly transparent in his escalation of the war. But if he had won the war, I think historians would have been very willing to forgive the kind of things that Johnson did to get the country into the war and fight the war. It's always ends versus means. Another example where I think victory has helped the president concern it was warranted would be Franklin Roosevelt in World War II. Franklin Roosevelt fought World War II in all sorts of ways, but one of them was by you know, tapping the telephones of his opponents and using the IRS, it was called the Bureau of Internal Revenue in those days, to go after press critics of his, uh, all sorts of invasions of civil liberties, things that really were violations of the law. Many of these were to track Nazi spies and do other things that helped to defend the country. But in retrospect, you know, the danger of Hitler and the Imperial Japanese we now see is so great that most historians are pretty willing to cut in some slack on some of the things that he did that he felt were required to do to at least win, not only win the war, but get it, get it going on a successful footing at the beginning. The problem with that is that you know, when historians bless the means because the ends turned out great, that has in history sometimes emboldened presidents to behave badly. I was talking about Richard Nixon earlier. Uh, when Nixon was driven out of office and pardoned, as you may have noticed, he spent the last 20 years of his life trying to revive his reputation. And one of the arguments he made was, why was I driven out of office? I didn't do anything different from Roosevelt. He wiretapped people, so did I. He used the IRS, so did I. You know, he did some of these other things. It's not very different. It didn't start with Watergate. I was a wartime president. He was a wartime president. I think here's a case where historians and later Americans are able to make the distinction that the kind of things that you may have to do to fight World War II and all that entailed are a little bit different from what Richard Nixon had to do in 1971 and 1972. Anyone else? I'm, I'm writing a book on presidents in wartime too, so I, I, can, I can give you a five hour answer if you want to have me back in three years. Uh, here in the back. Uh, you've mentioned quite a bit about people being reluctant to keep notes and sources and, and you're looking forward to President Clinton's papers being open. What I, I wonder, say, and I should say some of them have begun to be open. Mm -hmm. What I wonder about is, I know this is new and really in the last 15 years or so, but do you have any concerns or have you begun to get a sense of what all the electronic communication and how fleeting that can be is going to do to this type of research. Is anybody thinking about that? I mean, I know we've got, and I speak as one who poured over all the torture memos as they finally began to come out and thought, boy, there's an awful lot here to think mm -hmm. about. But I also am concerned uh, 
President Obama did an awful lot with blackberries and tweeters, and those are gone. And a lot of people communicate that way now. What, do you have it, it's all getting lost. And what's even worse about it is not just the information, but the way people felt at the time. For example, Eleanor Roosevelt was a great letter writer. She really poured her emotions into her letters. And there was a letter she wrote to a friend in the mid-1930s. One sentence tells you almost everything. She says about her, she's talking about her marriage. She said, she says, more and more I realize that Franklin is a great man, but he treats me like a stranger. You know, just one sentence in a letter tells you so much. You know, think how much her thousands of letters tell you. People don't write letters like that anymore. They send emails, but how many of us pour our hearts into emails? And maybe some people do, but not anyone I know. And it doesn't substitute for that. We're going to find we're going to have to find some way of preserving, not so much you know, the president did this and the president did that because there are five note takers and there are all sorts of people keeping very exact records of what he did. But what they're losing is how the president, the people around him, looked at a crisis that was going on, you know, the way that someone else was behaving at the time. We all have memories that revise themselves, you know, otherwise we probably couldn't go through life with the ordeals that all of us go through. And a president who is serving for four or eight years in a turbulent time, you can't expect him to remember how he felt about something five years ago uh, as, well as, he, you know, as well as he did at the time. So that is the kind of thing that we are beginning to lose. Uh, one way of remedying this, and it's only a start, is an oral history program. I think the Clinton Library is having the oral history program done by the Miller Center, the University of Virginia, which I'm a trustee of. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Miller Center does this for a number of recent presidencies. And the reason we do this is that for a presidential library, they're expensive, they're hard to do. Uh, they do require some expertise. And the example of where these oral history, everyone knows what an oral history program is, interviewing a president, people around him after they serve in office with documents to prompt their memories and so on. LBJ wanted his own oral history program in LBJ Library just after he left office. So you read uh, interviews that people at the LBJ Library did with people who worked very closely with Johnson. These were done a couple of months after Johnson left office. What was President Johnson like? President Johnson was always even-tempered. He never used bad language. <laughs> he was just the easiest person to work for. Uh, not exactly in sync with the facts. What was happening here? What was happening was that knowing Johnson, they knew that the second these interviews were done, they'd be typed up and the transcripts would be sent up to LBJ sitting up in his Barker lounger in the apartment so he could see what his aides really thought about what he did and what kind of a person he was. So needless to say, that whole history program did not work very well. But we historians and we Americans have got to find other ways to make sure that our history doesn't evaporate. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I would like for you to comment on the um, power that uh, history has personified in American history books recently of the power of J. Edgar Hoover uh, that he had over the executive branch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you think that history teachers are doing a great thing in the... In, uh, some, of, some, some of us are. Ms. <laughs> Johnson is a great history teacher, 12th grade. And I've got an 11th grader, so I know how hard that is. Thank, thank you for mentioning J. Edgar Hoover's influence on the executive branch. Well, I can speak with uh, some personal experience. I attended the funeral of J. Edgar Hoover. And what happened was, when I was 16 years old, I was working as an intern uh, in the office of a Senate colleague of Senator Bumper's, Adlai Stevenson III, who was a senator from my home state, worked in his office one spring. And J. Edgar Hoover died about May Day, 1972, that spring. And one ticket was given to each Senate office for the senator to attend Hoover's memorial service. Senator Bumpers had not come to the Senate yet, so he did not have the pleasure of attending. But uh, 100 tickets were sent to 100 Senate offices. The senators who admired Hoover you know, went to the rotunda and stood next to his coffin with an unhappy look on their face. <laughs> 
Stevenson, like some of the other Democrats and some Republicans, detested Hoover and thought he was a blight on the Republic. So he thought that his way of expressing himself would be to take the ticket to the memorial service and give it to the most insignificant little fool who was working in his office, <laughs> which was myself working the, the Xerox machine. <laughs> and so if you look at some of the photographs that were taken in the Capitol Rotunda from overhead, you know those shots that are looking down on the coffin? You can see people around the coffin, and there I am at the age of 16, standing right by at a great <laughs> historical moment. Uh, beyond that, uh, thank God our, our political system is such that it would be very unlikely that you would have someone with as much unaccountable power as J. Edgar Hoover had ever again. And for those who are too young to remember, uh, presidents treated J. Edgar Hoover extremely nicely because he, he amassed about very detailed files about their private lives and things that they might have done wrong. And so the president's concerned were a little bit nervous that if they crossed him, uh, Hoover would release these files, and, and indeed he did. He hated Martin Luther King and handed to reporters personally uh, th what he thought was damaging inter information on Dr. King in 1964. So, you know, despite some things that he did well in terms of fighting crime, I think that's you know way outweighed by his threat to civil liberties and. The good news is I can't see that happening again, thank God. I think we have time but, for one more question. But he didn't wear a dress. He did. <laughs> yes, sir, here in the middle. I'll also be around afterwards uh, so we, we can talk in case anyone hasn't had a chance to either ask a question or make a correction or <laughs> an opinion otherwise. Hi. Um, I'm a fan of both you and Doris Kearns Goodwin. Oh, thank you very much. And I, uh, I don't know the whole story, but I know she had some difficulties, a question about possible plagiarism. And I just wonder, uh, I think she had somebody working for her who might have done something questionable. I wonder if you can comment on it, and also just how do you go about your research? I mean, do you have people working for you, and how do you control for things to make sure those kinds of things don't happen? Well, how about if I answer the second part of the question, if that's okay? Uh, basically, I. I just do it all myself. So if I make a mistake, you know, please write me because I'm, I'm the one who's done it. Uh, it's, it's the way I've always worked and I'm not asking for angel's wings. Actually, the part of the process, or at least one part of the process I really enjoy is you know, coming into a library like the Clinton Library and going through files, preferably that have not been seen before, that have just been open. And to show you how grim my life is, this is like a kid on Christmas morning to be able to go through and see all this stuff for the first time, as I did with the LBJ tapes. Uh, maybe I'll close with one more story, and also makes the point about historical records. When I was doing that project on the LBJ tapes, I had heard that there was a tape of the flight that Lyndon Johnson took on November 22, 1963, from Dallas to Washington. For the younger folk, that was the day, of course, that Kennedy was assassinated with Johnson in the motorcade. Johnson got on Air Force One with Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Kennedy got on the plane with the coffin. And he was sworn in in that famous picture. Then Johnson says, let's get this plane airborne. And it was a lost tape. No one had heard it. And we didn't know if we could find it. But a history-minded person turned on a tape recorder so that all the radio traffic, Johnson's telephone calls, from that plane to the ground that day for the next two hours and 45 minutes were recorded for history. And fortunately, they were able to find the tape, and I was the first one who would listen to it, I think, in at least 35 years. And we put this thing on the machine, and we had no idea what was, go what was going to be on this tape. And what you hear is, you know, the plane taking off, you can hear the engine screaming, and you can hear people crying in the background, and LBJ gets on the telephone and he says, I, I want to talk to Midge Kennedy, meaning Rose Kennedy, the president's mother. And so the steward on the plane, dialing Rose Kennedy, you can hear it all on the tape, and he gets Rose Kennedy, who's just been told her son has been murdered, she's on Cape Cod, and he's about to say to her, I have President Johnson for you on the line, but he stops himself because he knows that for her to hear the words President Johnson, it's much too brutal. 
So he stops himself and he says, we have Mr. Johnson for you on the line. And LBJ gets on, says, you know, we're greeting with you. And Lady Bird gets on and says, we're lucky that the, the, the country had your son as long as it did. And by this time, Mrs. Kennedy is crying and just can't stay on. So she understandably has to get off the telephone. And just in terms of what one historical record can provide, you listen to that thing. If you read a transcript, it would tell you a lot. But listen to the actual sounds, the crying in the background, the tension on the plane, the tension in LBJ's voice. It gives you a sense of not only what it was like to be on that plane that afternoon, none of us were, very few people now alive were, but even more than that, what was it like to look at it through the president's eyes? What was it like to be Lyndon Johnson, who is suddenly president, after his predecessor has been murdered in his home state, when many Americans, maybe for a very long time, will wonder who committed the crime. There is nothing that can tell you that more than a historical record. And there's nothing that I think allows a historian to empathize with a president and understand it from his point of view than the kind of thing that I'm talking about, tapes and diaries, letters, other memos, preferably opened as quickly as possible. Thank you all very much again. <laughs>